Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Das Science, and today I want to talk about expectation values in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. Expectation values are a concept borrowed from basic probability theory, and they allow us to characterize probability distributions. The reason why they're useful in quantum mechanics is because we know that the information captured by a quantum state can be represented by a probability distribution. However, we have to be careful when using expectation values in quantum mechanics, because they're very often confused with the outcome of measurements. It is important to realize that expectation values and the outcomes of measurements are two completely different things in quantum mechanics. In this video, we'll explain in detail what expectation values are, and we'll make the distinction with measurement outcomes crystal clear. At the end of the video, we'll also see one of the many applications of expectation values, the root mean square deviation a quantity that features in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So let's go. In this video, we explore in some detail the probabilistic nature of measurements in quantum mechanics. And to start, let's have a quick reminder about measurements. We consider a physical quantity A and the associated observable A that is a Hermitian operator. We also build the eigenvalue equation for operator A, where lambda n are the eigenvalues, and un the eigenstates. Postulate 4 of quantum mechanics tells us that when we measure quantity A in a system in a state psi, the outcome of the measurement is eigenvalue lambda n with probability p given by the absolute value squared of the bracket between the associated eigenstate un and the state psi of the system. Remember from the video representations that we can expand our state psi in the u basis in terms of c coefficients, where these expansion coefficients are simply given by the bracket between u and psi. And given this, we can now also rewrite the probability of measuring eigenvalue lambda n as the absolute value squared of cn as shown up here. Okay, so feel free to pause here for a second because we've gone quite quickly over this. In reality, we've covered this in much more detail in the videos on measurements. So if you want a more in-depth description, then feel free to check those out before you proceed. So quantum mechanics doesn't tell us the precise outcome of a measurement. What it tells us is the probability associated with any given outcome. Another way of understanding this probabilistic interpretation is to imagine that we have many exact copies of the system in state psi, say n copies. When we measure a for each of these systems, we can get any of the possible eigenvalues as an outcome. Say for the first one, we get lambda 2, for the second, lambda 7, for the third, lambda 1, and so on. Let's say that we get eigenvalue lambda n a total of pn times. Then what postulate 4 says is that when the number of copies n of the system tends to infinity, the fraction of measurements that give lambda n, which is pn over n, tends to the probability p lambda n. The ideas we have discussed in these two initial slides should be familiar from the videos on measurements, and if you haven't seen them then I would encourage you to check them out before proceeding. What we'll do in this video is to consider two concepts from probability and statistics, expectation values and root mean square deviations, and see how we can use them to characterize quantum systems. To understand expectation values and root mean square deviations, it is very useful to use a pictorial representation. Let's draw a pair of axes. On the horizontal axis, we have the eigenvalues of the operator A, and I am placing them at arbitrary locations. Let's also write down the state psi of our system. And we consider its expansion in the basis of eigenstates of the operator A. As usual, these expansion coefficients are given by the bracket between u and psi. We're now going to place the probability p of getting a particular eigenvalue as the vertical axis. Postulate 4 up here then tells us that this probability p is equal to the absolute value squared of the c coefficients. So if we start with eigenvalue lambda 1, we get this of height c1 squared, and we can do the same for the rest of eigenvalues. In this schematic I am using arbitrary values for these c coefficients, but in a real situation we would get them from this expression here. So what this diagram is showing is what we call a probability distribution. The higher the lines, the more likely we will measure that particular outcome. So we know that in quantum mechanics we cannot know the precise outcome of a measurement before we perform it. What postulate 4 tells us precisely is the height of these lines. So it tells us precisely what this probability distribution is. 
That is the reason why in this video we'll explore how we can characterize such probability distributions. In the rest of the video, I will use a discrete spectrum of eigenvalues for our discussion to simplify notation, but all the ideas we'll discuss trivially generalize to continuous eigenvalue spectra. The only difference is that the probability distribution becomes continuous, say something like this. The next idea I want to explore is what happens in the special case when the state of our system is one of the eigenstates of the operator associated with the property that we want to measure. In this case, writing the state psi in the u basis only has one term, say um. This means that the expansion coefficient cm is equal to 1, while all other expansion coefficients are 0. In turn, this means that the probability of measuring the associated eigenvalue lambda m is 1. So in this case, there is actually 100% certainty about the outcome of the measurement. Put another way, if the system is in an eigenstate of the property we're measuring, then the outcome of the measurement is the associated eigenvalue with probability 1. If we now look again at the pictorial representation we've been discussing, then the probability distribution has a single peak of height 1 at the corresponding eigenvalue, and all other values are zero. So from our discussion so far, all that quantum mechanics teaches us about the quantum state is the probability distribution associated with a particular observable. However, probability distributions can sometimes be rather complex, which makes them cumbersome to work with and many times can obscure understanding. So what we'll do in the rest of the video is to define a number of quantities that will allow us to simplify the information encoded in a probability distribution. This will come at the price of losing some information, but the resulting quantities are very useful in many problems. The first quantity that we define to characterize probability distributions is the expectation value. We've seen earlier that if we have a very large number of copies of the system, then quantum mechanics tells us the exact fraction of measurements that will give a particular outcome. In this context, the expectation value tells us the average value of all these measurement outcomes. To make these statements concrete, let's consider a system in state psi. The expectation value of an observable A in the system in state psi is written as the associated operator A, written between angle brackets, and with a sub-index indicating the state psi of the system. Very often we will work with a fixed state psi, and if there is no ambiguity, we typically simplify this expression and omit the sub-index. If we get eigenvalue lambda n with probability p lambda n, then the average over all measurements is simply the standard formula for an average, so that the expectation value of a is equal to the sum over all n of lambda n p lambda n. Using the value of the probability that postulate 4 gives us up here, we can rewrite this as sum over n of lambda n absolute value squared of u n psi. What I want to show next is that in quantum mechanics we can calculate the expectation value using an alternative expression, the bracket between psi and then the operator A acting on psi. To see why, we start by inserting two identities on either side of A, we then insert the resolutions of these identities in the U basis as usual, then we move the sums to the beginning, and we end up with a double sum over three terms, psi un, un a um, um psi. We can now use the fact that the u basis is made of the eigenstate of the a operator to set this equal to lambda m um, and we can then rewrite this entire expression as sum over n m of lambda m and then these three terms. The middle term is delta n m because the basis is orthonormal, so we can perform the sum over m and end up with sum over n of lambda n absolute value squared of the bracket un psi. This is precisely the definition of expectation value up here, so we can indeed write the expectation value of a in the state psi as psi a psi. Okay, so some of you may have seen expectation values before, and if you have, then this is probably the expression that you have been working with. What we see here is why it takes this form. A quick comment before we move on. We typically work with normalized states psi, but if you were working with a state psi that is not normalized, then the expectation value can be very easily generalized to this expression, in which we explicitly normalize by dividing by the norm of psi. 
Many of you are probably familiar with expectation values from a standard probability, so most of what we have been discussing will be familiar. However, when we start learning about quantum mechanics, many of us confuse measurement outcomes and expectation values, so it is very important to make sure that these concepts are very clear. A question I often ask my students to probe their understanding is the following. Imagine that we have a system in state Psi. In that case, what value will we get when we measure A? Many students respond this. We calculate the expectation value of A in state Psi. Now, if you have been following, you will straight away know that this is the wrong answer. You will also know what the right answer is. The value we'll get is one of the eigenvalues of the operator A, but we cannot know which one we'll get. All we can know is what is the probability associated with each possible outcome. To make this point extremely clear, let's imagine a very simple situation. Consider a system with a two-dimensional state space, and we write the eigenvalue equation of operator A explicitly for the two eigenstates. The first eigenstate is u plus, with eigenvalue plus 1, and the second eigenstate is u minus, with eigenvalue minus 1. Now imagine that the state of our system is psi, and it is equal to 1 over square root of 2, u plus, plus u minus, where the prefactor is here to ensure normalization. So what are the possible outcomes of a measurement of A if the system is in this state psi? We have two possibilities. We can get eigenvalue plus 1 with probability 1 half, and we can get eigenvalue minus 1 with probability 1 half. And that's it. That's all we can say about the measurement of A in this system. Feel free to pause here for a second to cross-check this, but it should be clear after a moment. So by comparison, what's the expectation value? We can write out one of the many formulas we have for it. Expanding the sum, we get two terms, the eigenvalue plus 1 multiplied by its associated probability, plus the eigenvalue minus 1 multiplied by its associated probability. Both probabilities are 1 half, so we get this, which gives 0. So what do we have? The result of the measurement can only be plus 1 or minus 1 but the expectation value here is zero. So this shows very clearly that the expectation value doesn't tell us anything about the possible outcomes of a particular measurement. In this particular example, zero is not even a possible outcome of the measurement. Now that we've established this, can we understand why the expectation value in this example is zero? Our state is an equal superposition of two eigenstates. If we made a very large number of measurements, about half would give plus one, and about half would give minus 1. The average of these two numbers is indeed 0. Pictorially, we can again draw the axis, place the eigenvalues on the horizontal axis, and the probability on the vertical axis. Our probability distribution is then this, and the expectation value is in the middle of the distribution. It tells us the average of all outcomes, but in this particular example, it doesn't coincide with any possible outcome. Another important point about the expectation value is what happens when the state of the system is one of the eigenstates of the operator, say um. In this case, the expectation value is this, and using the eigenvalue equation here, we simply get lambda m, um, um, the basis is orthonormal, so we get lambda m. So in the special case of the state of the system being an eigenstate of the operator, then the expectation value is simply the associated eigenvalue. In this special case, the expectation value does coincide with the outcome of a measurement. But remember that this in general isn't true. The expectation value is a useful quantity, but it only gives us a rough idea about the probability distribution. To see why, consider again our axis. And as an example, imagine we have a red probability distribution and a blue one. Both distributions are symmetric about the center, so their expectation values are the same here. But if we only analyze these probability distributions using expectation values, there would be no way of telling these two distributions apart, although they obviously are very different. So this here is an example of the limitations associated with using a quantity like the expectation value 
to characterize something like a probability distribution which can be rather complex. What I want to do next is to consider a new quantity which will allow us to distinguish to some extent these two distributions. And it will do that by measuring their widths, which we can schematically represent like this and like this. Let's start by defining the mean square deviation. To do that, consider a new operator sigma a as equal to the operator a minus the expectation value of the operator a. We define the mean square deviation as the expectation value of sigma a squared. Plugging in the definition of sigma a, we see that it is given by this. Expanding the square, we get this. The expectation value of a scalar c is just the scalar itself. And as the expectation value is just a scalar, then the expectation value of an expectation value is equal to the expectation value. So using this, we can rewrite the mean square deviation as the expectation value of a squared. And then combining these two terms, we get minus the expectation value of a all squared. The quantity that's typically used to measure the width of a distribution is the square root of the mean square deviation. And it is done to ensure that the width has the same units as the quantity that we're working with. We therefore define the root mean square deviation delta a as the square root of the mean square deviation, which you can also write down in terms of this formula. So given this formula, is there an easy way to understand why this quantity tells us information about the width of the probability distribution? In this example, the two distributions have the same average in the middle, but different widths here and here. The sigma a is looking at how far we are from the average. If we simply calculated the expectation value of sigma a, we would get zero because the average is by definition the middle point of the distribution, so we have as many terms on one side as on the other, contributing with opposite signs and therefore cancelling each other. This is why we instead have to calculate the expectation value of the square so that the terms on either side of the average don't cancel. We then recover the correct units by calculating the square root of this expression. To finish, let's look at the root mean square deviation when the system is in an eigenstate of the operator that we're working with. Let psi be um. In this case, the expectation value of a is this. We can use the fact that um is an eigenstate of a, and we simply get lambda m. The expectation value of a squared is this. And using the eigenvalue equation twice, we end up with lambda m squared. We can now combine these two results to calculate the root mean square deviation. And it is given by this expression up here. And in our case, it is the square root of lambda m squared minus lambda m all squared. This is zero. And this tells us that the probability distribution has a width of zero. So does this result make sense? Let's draw again our pair of axes with the eigenvalues here and the probability here. We have already discussed that when our state is an eigenstate of the operator, then the probability distribution is zero everywhere apart from the position of the eigenvalue, where it is one. As the root mean square deviation measures the width of the distribution, then indeed it should be zero in this case because the distribution is all concentrated at a single point. The expectation value and the root mean square deviation allow us to characterize the probability distribution that is associated with the possible outcomes of a measurement in quantum mechanics. The expectation value gives us the average of the probability distribution. The root mean square deviation characterizes its width. We could, of course, come up with many other measures of probability distributions, but these two are the most useful ones. If you want to see an example of why, Check out the videos on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And as always, if you liked the video, please subscribe.